welcome to Halloween Blockbusters. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. That's nice. That's clever. I am your host, Joe Halloween, and joining me today is Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And my brother from another mother, George Johnson. How you doing? Welcome back. Uh, we are without Andrew today. He is under the weather. Uh, personally, I think he's out there TPing houses on Devil's Night. He's kind of he's kind of wascally like that. But um, I mean, who throws deviled eggs? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right. So this is our third podcast in October. All of them have had a Halloween theme. And today is uh, Halloween Eve, so we thought it'd be fun to go live. So we are live on ONTV and on Facebook. Hope you uh, are joining us. And what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to talk about our favorite horror movies, Halloween movies to watch this time of the year. Our first podcast in October kind of centered on slasher flicks. Yep. Our last podcast was uh, Movie Monsters. Now, there might be a little overlap today, but today's sort of an anything goes kind of a theme where, uh, you know, we can re repeat what you did last time or we can talk about movies we haven't talked about yet. Um, what I did is come up with a top 10 list of some of my favorite movies uh, that I like to watch this time of the year. And to be perfectly honest, October is really the only time I sit down and watch these kind of movies. It's not something I want to immerse myself in the rest of the year, even though I know uh, there are people like that. Uh, imagine those, Pete, are you the same way, or do you like watching horror films year-round? No, I, mean, I enjoy them year-round, but I, I love the month of October. There's something in the air, and the community helps sell it. As soon as it hit, hits October 1st, everyone puts out their Halloween decorations, whatever it's you know, any store in the neighborhood. I see the advertisements on TV, 31 Days of Halloween, <laughs> whether it's, you know, the classic movie channel, whatever it is. And I, I can't get enough of it. I, I love this month. You know, you, you said October 1st, and it kind of made me laugh because, you know, Halloween and fall is so fleeting. Uh, you know, just a week or so ago, trees were at their peak, and now I'm seeing that those same trees are bare. And because it's so fleeting, I see people starting to enjoy the season earlier and earlier. I mean, in a lot of stores, you can go back to early September, you start seeing a lot of that yep. Halloween product out there. And here in Lake Orion, they had a zombie walk in uh, mid-September. So for me, things sort of start to kick off mid-September. Oh, I'm, I'm full holiday capitalism. As soon as, <laughs> as soon as Labor Day ends, we are in that runway to the end of the year where let's just go for the... Uh, it's, so after Labor Day to October 31st, Halloween, November 1st, January 1st, Christmas. Very simple <laughs> in my life. As soon as all the Halloween stuff is done, November 1st, start the Christmas music. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, Thanksgiving gets a little lost in the transition. No, but, no, uh, there's uh, Christmas uh, turkey <laughs> and there's Christmas mashed potatoes. Just put the word Christmas in front of it. It's fine. Yeah. Everything I, will be fine. I kind of call it hollow thanksmas. It's just all a blur, you know. It oh, all let Twitter away. figure it out. They'll, they'll put some <laughs> gobbledygook hashtag on it. Yeah. No, it's uh, – <coughs> and, and Hollywood is the reason for that. Mm -hmm. Horror movies start on October 1st. Yeah. Christmas movies start November 1st, the Christmas season. All the big blockbusters come out in oh, November. Yeah. Potter and all those guys. Yeah. So it's, And they're all, all of them are released on, I see on Netflix, November 21st, November 15th. Why? We want to capitalize on, on the holidays. But before we yeah. talk about Christmas, this is Halloween. <laughs> I do want to say, and this is kind of spooky, just the other day I saw my first Christmas commercial where the Christmas music was playing in the background. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It's not even Halloween yet. And I already saw my first Christmas commercial. So, yeah, they're getting started. George, do you partake in the uh, spirit of this season? Absolutely. But every year I regret that we didn't do more. You know, <laughs> it, it comes to the night of, and I always get real anxious and real angry. And like, ah, I should have dressed up more. Like tonight I came in. I should have put on something more interesting. But uh, I, we used to do, when, the, when we had little kids, we used to do a, a shadow show where you put up a sheet and you project a... You oh, project nice. an image, and then it was always, you know, somebody, somebody. We would always have somebody, an adult. It was be two adults behind the sheet, and somebody would need an emergency pancreatic or pancreatectomy <laughs> or whatever. And then we'd pull out, you know, we'd pull out a, a a a saw, and we'd pull, you know, pretend to cut off an arm, and then you'd reach in and oh, there's the saw. How did you swallow the saw? You know, this kind of thing. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, we had a really good time. Um, 
I think Halloween is one of those really imaginative ones. I think Christmas is far less imaginative. Mm -hmm. Easter, July, uh, 4th of July, this is where it's everything goes, yeah. you know? And in some neighborhoods, I think it's like Mardi Gras or it's like uh, yes. Carnivale or oh something. Gosh, and they yeah. go nuts. Our neighborhood's really fantastic for that. We get people just literally dumping off their kids in front of our house and you can hear them say, well, we'll be back in an hour, you know, call yeah. us if you need us. And the kids just roam around and, um, so yeah, we love it. We absolutely love yeah. it. And I would hate, in fact, one of the things, reasons that we bought the house that we did is we wanted to be in a neighborhood where the kids could trick or treat. Cause you yeah. know, there's some neighborhoods that aren't even really neighborhoods. You know, they don't, there's no sidewalks. There's no, you got a lot of trees in between or there's too much frontage. And, and, uh, ever since the kids were little, it's always about a, is it H HPM houses per minute. How many houses per they minute? They have a formula. Oh, yeah. They do. And our, our, we've got a and really great HPM. Case, you fill that pillowcase. I didn't do the little plastic pumpkin bucket. No, I no, no. The pillowcase. The, the pillowcase really is the best. <laughs> oh, we got a conveyor belt at the house. I have tables <laughs> set up, and we have bowls of candy. When they come in, I take the bowl out, and they try and reach me. Like, no, no, no. I tip the bowl in. Their eyes light up. I just bought that child's love because they're like, this house has awesome food. Never been teepeed, never been egged. Yeah. This house is protected. Gosh, the kids in your neighborhood aren't trying hard enough. You know, that's an interesting <laughs> thing. Nobody really smashes pumpkins anymore. No. Yeah. No, I, you know, that really. was a great, it was almost like your duty as a teenage boy <laughs> to sneak out at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock when everything was quiet and go find the pumpkins that hadn't, you know, and you'd trash them. That was, that was fantastic. See, Nobody does that they're anymore. organized now. They're you're or risking the wrath of Sam, though. If you've watched a movie that we're going to be talking yeah. about in a little bit, one well, of the can't... rules of Halloween is that oh. if you smash so much pumpkin, Sam's going to come after you. So well, I, Sam, you're he, taking your... I've been risking your... that for, uh, <laughs> I, well, I did for the first 20 years of my life. Or you know what? That, but... I think back when I went trick-or-treating as a kid, the Seat houses... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the houses I remember as a kid were the ones that scared the heck out of me. Like, the, I remember a guy in an ape suit, like, you'd go up on the porch, ring the bell, and then a guy would jump out of the bushes and... Oh, we had one of those. Run off oh. screaming, and and that's the ones I remember, the ones that you know imprinted in my brain, and I would think yeah, about next year. You I know. feel the lawyers ruined that because all of a sudden they <laughs> pop out. Oh, I trip! I broke my ankle. <laughs> What's happened to you? Well, that's one right. year, one year, my friends and I, we were about twelve, thirteen, and we showed up to this house, and we knocked on the door. We could hear singing and dancing and all kinds of things. And we knocked, and nothing happened. We knocked again, and nothing happened. And we we're just walking off, and the door opened, and this. Gore this is when I lived in Santa Barbara. This gorgeous woman answered the door and she goes, Oh, you guys are trick or treaters. She goes, How about I give you something else? We're like, Oh, great. So we go running over. <laughs> oh, no. And she's wearing a low cut thing. And she <laughs> oh, leans no. over and she gives us a kiss on the cheek. Oh my god. I was on I was on cloud nine wow. for the rest of the night. I was like, that was the best. So you talk about a guy jumping out of the bushes at you. That was That's that was a very remember, special yeah. <laughs> That's when you're talking to you about it. Give me your costume. What? I gotta go back to the house. How many times are you going back, George? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put on another costume. Gotta put on another costume. I feel when like you... I've seen you before. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> when you mentioned the attorneys, you made me think of a line in a song by a local comedian named Haywood Banks and uh, there's a line that says uh, the the mall can't give out candy because of a lawsuit that they had. So here's a coupon for a futon on the bottom of your bag, and uh, it's a funny song ah. about all the, how Holly how Halloween has changed over the years. You know, so. maybe you guys can speak this. My brother, because uh, he's older, he's about seven years older than me, and he would say that when he was trick or treating back in the day. There was a scare because people were putting razor blades in apples and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, that never happened. No, but... you know what's interesting? It did happen, but investigations found out that it was done within the household. Ah. So a family member or somebody was the ones responsible for tampering with candy, and it caused huge scare. And then there was that Tylenol episode where someone had tampered with some Tylenol, and that almost resulted in the cancellation of Halloween. I remember there were hardly any What did Tylenol or have to do with that? Uh, I remember because, that they had... Yeah, it was right around the same time, I think. It was the and 80s, so, wasn't it? It was yeah, like the 80s. Yeah. And so people were afraid to go out and get candy from strangers, and the whole thing almost because fell that apart. had been tampered with. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is kids, and you remember this. Sometimes you'd go out, and you'd get uh, a nice wrapped Rice Krispies with M and M's. Yeah. Or you'd get like a caramel apple, a smaller caramel yeah. or a half a caramel. Oh, we or had to throw those cookies. out as a kid. We we couldn't accept any homemade stuff as a kid. We had to yeah. throw those in the trash. We that's what they told us to, but yeah. we would eat them by the time we, you'd walk up to some house and there's some sweet old lady handing these out you're like yeah. all right this is pretty cool i better eat this george yeah, yeah, you're so. describing hansel and gretel <laughs> <laughs> her house happened to be made of gingerbread. 
You are quick, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a moral to that story. She said something about a kiln that she wanted us to look yeah. at. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I remember. <laughs> Reach. The candy's in the back of the oven. Just Reach in there. over there, yeah. Uh, all right, so what we're here to do tonight is uh, talk about some of our favorite horror movies to watch this time of the year. So, uh, like I said, I created a top 10 list plus a couple of honorable mentions. And, again, there might be some overlap with previous podcasts. But uh, number one on my list, the movie that I love to watch every year at this time, I'll either watch it tonight or tomorrow, uh, is a movie that came out in 1985 called Fright Night. Yep. Uh, ah! To me, Fright Night for Halloween is like watching it's a wonderful life uh, for Christmas. Like it just encapsulates the, the spirit of the season so well. And it's funny and it's terrifying. And uh, it was written and directed by Tom Holland, not to be uh, confused with Spider-Man uh, and had such an amazing cast. Uh, Chris Sarandon was uh, our vampire. Uh, William Ragsdale, Amanda Beer, Stephen Jeffries as Evil Ed, and of course Roddy McDowell as Peter Vincent. Uh, it, you know, oddly, as I was looking up some information on this movie, it actually came out in August. I don't remember that. I saw it in the theater, and I don't remember going to see it in August. I thought I saw it closer to Halloween, so maybe maybe it had some legs and stayed in the theater maybe. for a few months. Or but. they re-released it because some suit realized, oh yeah. my God, it's not even Labor Day. <laughs> Now it wasn't a huge hit. It earned about twenty-five million on a seven to nine million dollar budget, um, but it has become a cult classic. And on yeah. Rotten Tomatoes, uh, critics give it an eighty-three percent, uh, audience gives it a seventy-six percent. But uh, it's not only one of my favorite Halloween movies; it's one of my favorite movies in general. It's on my top one hundred movie list. And over the past couple of years, and I'm going to bring up an image uh, for those of you watching on video. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've met four of the cast members. Uh, Chris Sarandon, our, our uh, Jerry Dandridge, the vampire, he was at Motor City Comic Con a number of years. That is and, so cool. Yeah. That yeah. is so cool. And then a few years ago, <laughs> William Ragsdale and Amanda Bierce were uh, at some horror con together. So they were right next to each other. And we got to talk about, you know, that and her role on Married with Children when she and was And his on role there. in Herman's Head. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and then uh, about a year or so later, uh, Stephen Jeffries, who played Evil Ed in the movie, he showed up at another local horror con. And uh, the cool thing about that is I was able to talk him into uh, an interview. And so I have a short little interview that I did for a show called Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. And uh, we're going to go to that now. I'm going to bring it up on the screen, and we'll play it. Joe Johnson here with the great Stephen Jeffries. How are you, Stephen? Great to see you. Thank you. Everything's uh, coming up roses. <laughs> Talk about the environment here today, meeting uh, the people who enjoy your work. Yeah, I mean, these uh, conventions are always just like uh, one big love fest. Bright Night was one of the great movies to come out of 80s, just a great era for movies. What are your memories working with that amazing cast on that movie? Yeah, it, it, everyone in it was uh, perfectly cast, and uh, we were all very excited about it. You know, I um, mean, we all wanted to make sure that it turned out good, and, uh, and it, it, it was a blast making it. Roddy McDowell, a legend at the time. What was it like working with Roddy? Uh, I mean, I was overwhelmed. Uh, he, he, he's, he's the real deal, you know, and he's like Hollywood royalty, you know, and uh, re really sweet, wonderful person, a very nice man. Yeah. Now you had some great moments, great lines in the movie. I, I say you stole the movie. What are some of the lines that people come up to you and go, say the line? I would put You're So Cool Brewster at the top. The, the writing, you know, Tom Holland wrote, wrote a great script, so, it, you know, it, the, the, the entire script was great. You know, oh, his dinner's in the oven. That's right. How could I forget that? So what are your memories of seeing the movie for the first time with those amazing practical effects? What was your reaction sitting in the theater watching? Yeah, it, it, it was just magical because you don't know what goes on after the film wrapped. So you see all of the wonderful work that uh, people put into making it uh, as good as it was. So it was wonderful. 
Now you told me earlier those contacts weren't the most comfortable. No, they uh, they were brutal. They were painful. Um, but you know, it was worth it. The end result ma made it uh, well worth the pain. 35 years later, almost 40 years later, we're still talking about Fright Night. What does that mean to you? You never know when you make a movie, you know, how it's going to end up. But, you know, the fact that I'm here talking to you uh, after all this time is uh, pretty amazing. Never would have thought. Pleasure meeting you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. <laughs> that is so, yeah, so it's, cool. uh, it's always cool meeting these actors who... Uh, <clears throat> Who appeared in the movies that you grew up with and that you loved? You and talk about the practical effects. I so those were real tears when you had those contacts in there because oh, man. those must have hurt. But it really, their master's going to kill you. The, they, the teeth that he had, and I was like, how did he get his lines out? Because the teeth were coming out all which way. Oh, and uh, that that's a true thespian right there. I yeah, got, I've got the trump card here today. Uh, oh, this dear. is I'm going to put this up if you can see it. This is my son who just starred oh, wow. as Eddie. Or what's his name again? Evil Ed. Evil, Evil Ed, Ed in all oh, the stage version. The stage version in, in New Jersey. Fright cool. Night. Oh, in Fright Night. There he is. Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah, that's him. And uh, he, uh, I had never really even heard of the movie until just just recently. Can you see that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you see that at all? Yep. Anyway, um, just a really cool, great cast. Um, there's another great picture of him. Let me see if I can get this. Um, this is the this is the prostitute, and she's wearing a terrible wig there. But it's just <laughs> this really cute young lady, twenty one, twenty two, and and she's uh, she's six, I think six foot one, six foot two. Anyway, he just had a blast. He oh, just cool. absolutely had a blast, and he does get all the lines. Um, it was rewritten the play, not going down a rabbit hole too far, but the play was rewritten, and it had had some different nuances to it. So we watched the movie. I was about to say because I don't remember you led attacking a prostitute. Well. Well, I know Jerry Dandridge, he that's where he would that get was his just, meals did. from. But yeah. That was just a picture it. that we did. Yeah. It wasn't oh, actually, he I wasn't see. turned into. Oh, gotcha. Dracula. Oh, gotcha. We, gotcha that gotcha. was just at the end. We're taking some silly pictures. Oh, but, fantastic. Um, but no, that was really cool. So so uh, he goes, hey, you guys should watch it. And I go, I don't want to watch it. I don't want to be surprised. I want to see. <laughs> so we saw the play first. Oh, interesting. And then we went back and saw the movie. And uh, the movie's really actually entertaining. It's yeah. It's got a thick slice of cheese in it. But yeah. it's. I think it's um how do you say it it's 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 a it's well meaning it's got a lot of heart I guess I don't know how to explain that but it's like it's 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 still there's not yeah. an undertone of real sinister satan worshiping evil and stuff yeah. it's still campy enough that it's if it, it feels it feels like you're sitting around a a campfire I guess yeah. and and telling stories and that's what came up I really enjoy it, yeah. Yeah, I like how it, it hits the ground running. Like, almost immediately, yeah. uh, Charlie sees this, you know, guy moving a coffin into the house. And, you know, it, it basically addresses the question, what would you do if a vampire moved in next door? Yeah. And it has a little bit of, like, a real-world feel to it and, you know, trying to find someone to believe you and all that and stuff. And we're not and, talking about the sparkly I love you vampires. We're talking yeah, about yeah. a serial killer vampire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so all the performances were great, and uh, man, I I just have a visceral memory of seeing it in a the theater for the first time and almost hyperventilating because it it had some really genuine scares in it. Uh, when when uh, Amanda Bierce, uh Amy, when she gets converted, and her face uh, comes up, woo, that's that scared the heck out of me when I saw that in the theater. So and the um, practical effects too. Yeah, when they were in the basement and you see Jerry all messed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What now, Vincent? I'm like, oh my <laughs> God! How long were you in the makeup chair for that? You that have weird. to have faith, Mr. Vincent. Yeah, and a uh, little little tidbit. Uh, when when they start ripping down all the curtains and everything and shining sunlight on on Jerry Dandridge near the end, there's a there's a moment where he looks like a giant skeletal bat or something pushed up against the wall and then he kind of implodes into nothing. Yeah. I had learned that that was uh you that was an unused prop uh from Poltergeist. Oh. That that particular prop had been built for Poltergeist and they're like, well, that scene got cut or whatever, so they reused it for fright night but yeah i think it's it's genuinely scary it's laugh out loud funny and like you said it's earnest like it's just sort yeah. of a feel good sort of a movie i love that poltergeist tip but that's almost like saying 
hey, uh, we're not going to use any of this, so take whatever you want for the end of your movie. Uh, That's right. Todd, yeah, is that a Godzilla head? Yeah, there's no Godzilla in this movie. What are you doing? Is Never that mind yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, just, I, started, I saw it. I thought it'd be cool. I'm like, yeah. What, what, it's kind of fun sometimes when you see props reused from film to film, and you go, oh, I recognize that one. That was in a different movie. It's like and the city like from Back tribute. to the Future. I mean, how yeah. many times have I seen that 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 exact yeah, yeah, that was in Gremlins oh, and uh, Gremlins. Yeah, gosh, a couple other movies. But yeah, that that Universal Studio backlot has been in many, many movies. In the yeah. old in the old days, the Robbie the Robot it seemed like he was in everything too. Anyway, yeah, 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 television, movies, all that stuff. Yeah, all right. So that's a for me, that's a must watch. And if you haven't seen the original Fright Night, forget about the remake or the sequels. Uh, watch the original Fright Night. Yeah. I think there's some. Brief, brief nudity, so you might not want to watch it with the really young ones, but uh, for me, it's a fun one to watch this time of the year. Now, I'm curious how you guys are going to respond to this next one because it's, for me, it's it's a terrifying movie. It, it definitely qualifies as a horror film, but this is more in the realm of sci-fi horror, and I might have a couple of films on here that would be considered sci-fi horror. Uh, this one is Alien, 1979. Yeah. Uh, directed by Ridley Scott, starring Sigourney Weaver, Tom Skerritt, John Hurt, uh, Harry Dean Stanton. Oh. Ian Holm is Ash. Uh, it earned $187 million on an $11 million budget. And, uh, again, it's beloved on Rotten Tomatoes, 93% from critics, 94 from audience. And I remember, you know, seeing this in the theater as a kid. And then when there was a thing, and, and this is sort of a coincidence, but I don't know if you guys remember or heard of something called On TV not on tv like we're doing now uh on tv was a a paid subscription service that started its day like at 7 or 8 p.m and went till midnight or 1 p.m and every month they would get some new movies like movies would leave and they would add new movies and i remember when alien was added to their rotation they showed it over and over and i watched it over and over and I know every line, it's every beat. A masterpiece. It really is. It's a masterpiece. I yeah. mean, you, you, it's it's absolutely amazing, and you can see all everything that followed after it is is Paying homage it's, or yeah. it's an homage. It, it's what what happens when you have a monster you can't get away from. Yeah. If this is Halloween, you run out of the house, you run into the forest. Where, but what if you're in outer space yeah. where no one can hear you scream? There you right? go. <laughs> what, what happens when you're out of space and you're inside of this thing and it keeps getting smaller because areas of it keep getting blown up and so forth. And the the one that's least likely to survive or some pipe might find that is the one who survives. Yeah. And if you haven't seen it and hope, hopefully that didn't ruin it. But <laughs> uh, I absolutely uh, just adore this. Every time yeah. I see this movie, I just love it. The pace and I love aliens. Yeah, which Just, is a different movie. That's more of a, a, different movie. a war that's, movie yeah, where Alien is flat out horror. And, you know, we saw things in Alien we had never seen in movies before. And uh, they used H.R. Uh, Giger, I think is his name. Yeah, Giger. Yeah, and exactly. they, they used his, his designs that were just so disturbing. And they borrowed heavily from his imagery. And he designed the alien and the face hugger and, and tapped into these fears that people have specifically men uh where the face hugger the idea of that face hugger attaching itself to a person's face and ramming its uh egg layer down your throat <laughs> that taps into something primeval yeah. where men are spe specifically men but i'm sure women too are just squirming in their seats like and then the payoff horrific horrific oh and then the payoff Yes. Yeah. Where that's, you got, and again, that's another male phobia is, is he, he got giving, impregnated by Giving this, birth, uh, the worst cesarean, <laughs> exactly. So it really kind of tapped into these fears and phobias that people have. And uh, it was so effective. And that alien design was so cool. And the way, you know, there's, I love upon rewatching it, trying to spot it in the background because it's sort of blended in with the, with the uh, hardware and the technology in the background where you think it's a, a duct or, a, you know, a heat yep. vent or whatever, yeah. and then you see it start to the move. the polish of its head looks yeah. like a tube of some kind. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, basically, I guess 
I had read that Alien wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Star Wars. Star Wars was such a huge success. And they said, well, let's do a scary Star Wars. And so we, uh, Alien owes a lot to Star Wars being a success. And it was really cool that they took the concept of being in outer space and turning it into a, a isolated, claustrophobic uh, horror movie. It really is the other end of the spectrum, isn't it? Because yeah, yeah. Star Wars is going to different places, seeing different things. This is literally one planet, one you know, well, I guess it's a it's a it's a couple of different spaceships, but yeah, um, it really opened up what could be done. Yeah, well, sure. Because I, I, I think that you got a sense that, and this is the same thing with, if you look at Logan's Run, which came out about that time, and there was a few other movies that came out, especially in the '60s, you'd see these things that were kind of, and they were kind of these cheap ships. And I think, what was it, two, uh, 2001 came out in 69, is that right? Yeah, and really focused on realism, yeah. And that just, you looked at the ships and there was a certain part, certain amount of gravity. And as I understand it, what the, what they would do is they would shoot the film at 60 frames per second, mm -hmm. and then they would back it down to 30 frames or 25 frames. And for whatever reason, things looked heavier, Yeah, looked a little more substantial. And uh, when you watch Alien... It does have that feel, and they go into that big field where all the pods are, and it, you, it gives you a much larger sense of just this vast area. The, the scale of it, yeah. The scale of it, exactly. And the ship, I could never make sense of what the Geiger thing was. Was that an alien that had died in a chair looking out, <laughs> a, out of the, the sights of a gun? Yeah. I, I couldn't figure that out. Yeah. They, 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 bothered, they bothered zero about explaining anything. Any of that. Until those prequels came out. And, yeah, that's, and that, that's the right, problem I have that. with the prequels to Alien is they try to over-explain everything and how these things were uh, engineered, bioengineered. And I don't need to know all that. That's what I loved about the movie. Exactly. If, if, you're, if you're in space and you're landing on a planet that humans weren't even aware of, there's not going to be human-looking creatures. There's going to be things we've never seen exactly. before. And that was these eggs and the alien and the ship and... You know, the ship isn't symmetrical. It's like this horseshoe thing that had landed on the planet, and it just looked organic, and the interiors were organic. And you don't need to have someone, you know, uh, do an exposition of, of what this is. You don't need to know that. It it's barred so a little bit of Jaws, really, the unknown. Yeah. You let your imagination feel like, what kind of messed up race or entity created these <laughs> pods that j latch onto your face? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love what you said about the ship because Star Wars was so cool because you could tell that the ships were in a dogfight. So it was like yeah. World War II, right? Or even like the Red Baron, World War One. That was a ship that had nothing to do with that. That was a ship that was there to... And um, I think Star Trek borrowed heavily from that. Like yeah. the later Star Treks, not the first, you know, 60s versions. Yeah. I, I That's an excellent comment. Yeah, and you know, the thing too is I think one thing that Alien owes to Star Wars, too, is this lived-in realistic universe where a lot of sci-fi up to that point were shiny spacesuits and ray guns and Very helmets clean. and ships were shiny and flame coming out of the back. And then Star Wars sort of just kind of jumped right into it where Luke's land speeder looked like, you know, a teenager's car that was beat yeah. to hell and everything looked real and, and lived in. And, and so Alien introduces this idea of the this crew working in space together like you would on a oil rig or something out in the middle of the ocean. I and, love that. And it just added this air of realism. Like, yeah. that, that could be the future of just teams of construction workers uh, going into hypersleep to go mine ore on some other planet. It was and really the, fascinating. The idea of being stuck in, in an environment by yourself with this thing and that's where the thing which yeah. came out a couple of years later which is brilliant which is, as yeah. well next if, on my list if you're stuck in the Antarctic, like in an environment okay go out go out into the antarctic see what happens to you 40 below you won't last long just like in space yeah well it's the same thing yeah. and then I've, I've i've made this case before um uh the jurassic park borrows from that too because they get yeah. stuck inside and outside are all the the aliens and they're coming in, or not the aliens, but the dinosaurs, dinosaurs are yeah. coming in. It's the same thing. Well, let's let's use this to segue into the thing because that's next on my list. 1982, a John Carpenter film. Uh, it's based. Uh, this is interesting. It's based on a 1938 novella called "Who Goes There," uh, by John W. Campbell, and of course it stars Kurt Russell, Wilford Brimley, Keith David, just a great cast. 
And uh, guy, we got to give a props to this guy, Rob Botton, who did the uh, creature effects in the thing, which they were just awesome. jaw dropping. They were awesome. Uh, now, some people may be aware of the fact that the thing was an enormous flop when it uh, came out. Uh, it only earned about twenty million dollars on a fifteen million dollar budget. Ouch! Of course, today it's it's widely regarded as a classic, and on Rotten Tomatoes, critics give it an eighty-five, audience give it a ninety-two. Uh, Siskel and Ebert uh, described it as horror porn, and uh, they were put off by the effects. While you know, I'm a I'm a teenager. I think I was about sixteen years old when this came out, and I'm sitting in the theater with my jaw hanging open, going, "My God, how did they pull this off? These effects are amazing!" And it kind of breaks my heart to think that John Carpenter is reading these reviews, panning this movie, and. He's like, well, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> and I, I know I did. I loved it from the get-go. And every, I'm every so once glad in a while, found an audience. Siskel and Eber like to become Waldorf and Statler. They just sit from the <laughs> Yeah. Well, it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, come on, guys. It's a, it's a, it's a horror flick. Yeah. I, I'm with you, Joe. I, I would really be... It's another masterpiece. Not maybe, as, as in my opinion, as good as Alien, but really well done. Yeah. And the, uh, the morphing... And showing all that, and and the way that they all get together, and uh, Kurt Russell couldn't be a better oh, first great. first man, and it's, that's straight out of uh, <laughs> as I mentioned before, straight out of uh, Escape from New York. Yeah, yeah. But he cleans up his swagger a little bit, um, and he's more of a scientist, but he's still a bad a mofo. He's just yeah. awesome. Yeah, and he has to be because they're they're like they don't trust him. They're like ready to gang up against him. I love him, that and he Keith David and him ground. are the last ones left. Like, yeah, I, and I love that's that potentially for me is the best part of the movie. The ambi- ambiguity of the ending and not the ambiguity knowing, of yeah. the ending. Yeah, because it's not oh they escaped or one person or three people or five people got away like in like in uh, Jurassic Park. Yeah, these two guys could not go back inside. Yeah, and it was getting cold. And thank you for watching. Have a nice day. And I'm yeah. sitting watching. I'm watching this on VHS with a friend of mine. Maybe two years after it, after it came out, absolutely stunned. We slept on the couch, and in the middle of the night, I woke him up because I was screaming. And then a little <laughs> bit later, he woke me up because he was screaming. Because it's so. It was you know it was like 13 years old, and that yeah. was just amazing. That's not a movie to drink <laughs> and watch. That's, yeah, nothing good can come of it. No. Now, uh, we did a podcast on how some movies are derivative or pay homage uh, homage to uh, movies that came before it, and I kind of accidentally stumbled onto this. I hadn't really thought about this, but a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, okay, I want to watch something spooky for the Halloween season. I ended up popping in a little movie uh, called uh, Invasion of the Body Snatcher. Oh, Nice. Then this past weekend, the thing just happened to be playing on AMC, so I sat down to watch it and started picking up on some similarities. The similarities, really? be, even though the thing is based on the novella that came out a long time ago, there are a lot of similarities between the yeah. thing and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Not knowing who to trust, who's the thing, who's not the thing, right. looking for signs like how can you tell that yeah. they've been converted? Um, they are very, very similar movies cut from the same cloth. And w- the thing also, you know, uh, plays up the claustrophobia of being isolated. And those are elements that we saw in Alien. So you see a lot of these elements kind of being repeated in various and films like in, in different degrees. Like in Fright Night, thing starts right off with a helicopter chase with the dog. Mm-hmm. They don't waste oh, any time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, right off the bat. They, they're like, yeah. why is this? Wait, you saw the 1970s version? Uh, yeah, the one with Donald Sutherland. Uh, uh, yeah. And Leonard Nimoy. That's, that's, yeah. that's the one we were talking about. I yeah, love yeah. that one. It's yeah. slow. It is, but it's fascinating. But it's fascinating. Yeah. And it, yeah, and it and builds. It's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. Yeah. And it builds the tension. There's an element of cheese that the 1950s, 1960s version had. Yeah. And, and I don't I remember like sitting down one, and though, watching too. that one. But what I did appreciate is in the, the 70s uh, remake, uh, Kevin McCarthy, I think is his name, who was the lead actor in the original black and white one, has a short cameo in the 70s one where no. he comes up against the car window and he's like, they're coming to get us. They're <laughs> coming to get us. The same and guy so, who's The yelling? same actor. Oh, so now they're not saying it's the same character, but the, the, they brought the same actor no, back to, that's, for the I remake. Love if, it's the same, if it's the same character, I've been saying it for 25 <laughs> years, guys. What the hell is wrong with you? Yeah. So there are a lot of similarities, but I got to say the, the thing just blew my mind and the, the effects and 
Uh, here's kind of a cool moment. I know I do a lot of name dropping on this podcast, but I was in L.A. a few years ago, and I liked to go into Quentin Tarantino's uh, movie theater that he bought called the New Beverly Theater. And it was like October 1st, and they were showing the thing on the big screen. And I'm like, oh, I got to see it on the big screen again. So I go in there. I'm sitting in the audience eating popcorn, <laughs> really enjoying the heck out of the movie. And then the credits are rolling, and I kind of sit there, you know, soaking it all in, watching the credits. And people around me are getting up and leaving when the manager rushes out <laughs> up front, and he's like, wait, wait, don't go. Uh, T.K. Carter is here who played Knowles in The Thing. And he comes what? walking up, half the crowd had left, and starts doing a Q&A in front of the theater. Where, so where was this again? This was uh, at Quentin Tarantino's movie theater in L.A. called and they the, hadn't, the New Beverly. And, they and nobody knew announced. he was going to be there. And so he did a Q&A, and I sat there, and they're like, anyone have any questions? I was like, ah! And uh, my question was, what was the cast reaction? Because these were in-the-room practical effects, what was your reaction to seeing, you know, the partly transformed thing that they had dug out of the ice and had in the lab? And he goes, he says, it was absolutely amazing. He says, I will tell you this. No one wanted to be the last guy out of that room to turn out the lights. <laughs> like it was that terrifying that no one wanted to be left alone with this thing on the table. And I thought that was hysterical. That's Isn't great. That I will say this. I, I do love Joe's story. I mean, he, he he's gotten to a point where he's almost like a, like a, Kung Fu master. He just slides it in there. He'd be like, you know, I was, uh, I don't mean to name drop. I was doing this one thing and, you know, Stephen came by. I said, Stephen, you can't just park your car wherever you feel like it. You, you know, know what? A friend of mine brought that up just recently. And I, I said, I, I feel like Forrest Gump, where I just go through history winding up in, in the presence of greatness and presidents of the United States and actors and athletes. I just sort of find myself in that position. So. You know, I was out this. I was at this restaurant where I thought, you know, you know, uh, the, the, we were having just a, a food thing. I looked over. I, said, I saw Spielberg souffle. I said, you know, get the souffle proper. You gotta just, you gotta do it right. He's like, yeah. thanks, Joe. Yeah. One of the weirdest moments. I'm sure I, I brought this up before, but I was at the Hollywood sign just a couple of years ago, and as I was getting ready to leave, Patrick Stewart walked right yeah. past me, and I stopped and turned and said, "Hi, Patrick." Hello, young man. You know, it's like I just ran into Patrick Stewart at the Hollywood sign. Isn't that a fantastic? touristy destination. There's Patrick Stewart. So, yeah, that, so that was pretty cool. So, all right. So the, the thing is number three on my list, one of my all-time favorite movies. Here's another one that's kind of done in the same vein, another remake, uh, The Fly, 1986, uh, directed Goldblum. by another horror master, David Cronenberg. Uh, incredible performance by Jeff Goldblum Absolutely and uh, Gina Davis. Uh, effects by Chris Wallace and makeup artist Stephen uh, Dupuis. D U P U I S. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Du Dupuis. 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 Yeah. Um, but here's what's interesting. Now, if you've seen The Fly, have you both seen The Fly? Yeah. You know, here Cisco and Ebert are calling the thing horror porn. The Fly, which you know came out a couple years later, took it to the next level. It's it's horrific. Guess what? Those guys won an Oscar. They won an Academy Award for their effects on the, the fly. The world wasn't ready for, I guess, for the thing. I yeah, guess. but there were probably two votes that went against them, and it's <laughs> Waldorf and Stadler again. I can't bring myself to vote for these yeah. two. We have to be consistent. Now, I, I rewatched The Fly about a year or so ago, and it is stomach turning. Like it, it. Yeah. it is horrific some of the stuff that they do I get, in that I get film. phantom pain in my ankle. <laughs> and if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, there's a, yeah. you know what's funny? So in the original uh, Fly, there's a famous line where uh, the fly with the human head is trapped in a spider web, and he's going, help me, please help <laughs> yeah. me. Well, they put that line in the remake. The problem was that, G Gina Davis like leans in to hug him and his ear falls off. And as the crowd is screaming, he He's... says to Gina Davis, help me, please help me. No one heard the no. line because people were screaming, screaming. in the audience. Oh. So you kind of have to watch it repeatedly. Why do you, why do you think nobody that heard that? I don't know, man. Because maybe <laughs> the ear fell off the guy and it hell out of the audience. Uh. You know, Jeff Goldblum's got those those very large expressive eyes. Yeah. Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't say they're bug eyes but it they <laughs> are the yeah pardon the term but i mean they're so cool he's such an expressive guy favorite line the whole thing tell me gina davis says oh no you're getting worse he goes i'm not getting worse i'm getting 
better. Oh, and he's that's like, right. He's, he's, he's stronger. Apart. He's doing like he, Olympic gymnast moves and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and she sees it, and he's turning. He's getting yeah more muscular and all that. Yeah. It's just very strange. It's it's you know in hindsight it's so crazy to think that the studio was like Jeff who no we we need like a name actor in this thing and they fought against him and it was a career changing role it it it, it elevated him to superstardom. By the way, we're we're live. Are we getting any audience feedback? Are we getting like slanderous Slander. comments made? You might have there? to log into the ON TV Facebook account and see if there's any comments on there. I don't know. Maybe I'll bring it up on the laptop. I've been looking at the comments there. from my family. They've been they've been sending some nice comments. So that's <laughs> good. But uh, that's, those are the only other people I I look. I wonder if Andrew's going to hate text us. <laughs> yeah, right. He's sitting at home. You guys doing this with? I haven't seen that movie either. <laughs> I kind of, you know, he just watched the thing this past weekend, and he, so I wanted to get his feedback on it. But God bless him. He, it, he's but. putting in the work. Yeah, like, he's said he's, he's going to watch. Movies. Checking off the, the yeah. hundreds of movies that are on the list that he needs to watch. Um, so yeah, so the fly, uh, it was a pretty big hit, 60 million on a nine to $15 million oh, budget, gee, wow. 93% on rotten tomatoes. So, um, but like I said, it's not something I want to sit down and watch on a regular basis. I dust no. it off every few years because, you know, it's so graphic and, and so hard to watch at times, you know, when he trying to eat uh, donuts and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, vomiting like, on them. And, and how they, you know, take the characteristics of a fly. And that's how a, flies eat. It had a yeah. regrettable sequel with Eric Stoltz. Yeah, yeah. Which I was like, didn't you already play a very difficult role that you won an Oscar <laughs> for? Why would you do this? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, and that, you know, it's those types of sequels in nice. the 80s that, you know, gave sequels a bad name for the longest time. You know, you get a Jaws, and then a Jaws 2, and you get a Fly, and then a Fly 2, and they always Bright Night, stunk. the sequel. Yeah, the sequels were always inferior, and it was just a, a quick And infuriating. Yeah. yeah. And infuriating, yeah. because you're like, I want to see the story arc continue. Somebody yeah. survived this idea. And you go in, and it's just like, you walk out going, there was an exec someplace. Nick's going to have a better line about this than I am. But you had some exec saying, Wow, we got a lot of people that came out and really love this. It's doing really well on VHS. Let's let's just put anything we can with that yeah. name on it, and we're guaranteed to make yeah. at least what we made the first time around. And Jaws too made a ton of money. It was a, a phenomenon. But I just recently watched it, and it's so inferior. It feels more of like a Friday the Thirteenth sort of a you yeah. know one victim after another after another and it's so inferior to the first one but it made a ton of money and that's why they do it it's it's funny because they say i want to capture the same magic but i want something entirely different like your words don't your the beginning of your sentence doesn't match the ending of your sentence yeah uh, you ha if you were on the visiting end of a suit you go like you make no sense to me yeah it's like four plus four is jello <laughs> <laughs> i think that the deep came out uh, kind of after that did you ever see the isn't that oh the yeah deep? jacqueline Bissett. Pretty famous scene in that movie, yeah. That, that was cool because I think they just decided, hey, you guys have missed the ball here. Let's go. Let's go in another direction. But yeah. it's again that that cat is that uh, claustrophobic, right? Um, underwater, which I think the abyss took from as well. Yeah, yeah. Those were the really, really deep part of the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, with the su success of Jaws, you know, there's always the copycats and stuff. And again, this goes back to the podcast we had a while back, but. After Jaws, you had uh, Orca, which uh, oh. uh, had Linda Evans in it, I believe, or was it Bo Derek? I get those two mixed up. Uh, but it was about a killer whale. Mm -hmm. And uh, Piranha and Tentacles, which was about a squid. You know, you got all these knockoffs that come yeah. out in the wake of success. So, yeah. Um, all right, moving on. Number five on my list. Again, this is this is like, you know, again, watching uh, It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas Time. Uh, <laughs> I discovered a movie called Trick or Treat. It uh, came out in 2007, which I can't believe it was that long ago. To add that on. Is it pretty good? Trick or Treat. I loved it. Um, now, here's what's interesting. It got a very limited release. And when I say very limited release, if you look up its theatrical grosses, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not hundreds of millions, hundreds of thousands thousands of dollars it got a very limited release and only found an audience when it was released on dvd now i had read uh reviews of the movie like in entertainment weekly that just praised the heck out of it the problem was i couldn't find it playing anywhere near me so i waited for it to be released on dvd and the day that it came out on dvd i bought it sight unseen 
went home, popped it in, played it, and thought, this is a perfect Halloween movie. I'm glad you brought that up. Is it R yeah. or do you know? It's what? It's, it's R, then I take it. It's not a... Uh, well, for violence and stuff, probably. There's not a lot of nudity. There's there's sort of a werewolf transformation scene that has prosthetic nudity, so it's not like real nudity. Um, so if it did get an R rating, it was for more of the violence than than the, any nudity or anything like that. But sure. it's an anthology where there's like five different stories that sort of interweave. Like it'll tell one story, then it'll segue into another story, but then you might see some of the characters that were in the first story appear in the second story, and they all sort of interweave and, and uh, interact with each other, and it's so much fun. Uh, written and directed by uh, Michael Doherty, and a pretty good cast. Uh, Anna Paquin's in it, Brian Cox, uh, Leslie Bibb in sort of a comical role. Um, and they introduced a brand new horror character because we've we've had Michael Myers, we had Jason, we had Freddy, right. and so it was time for a new horror movie figure. So they introduced Sam, who's probably what about three feet tall, wears orange footy pajamas and a burlap sack over his head. And he enforces the Halloween rules. There's a list of things that you can and can't do uh, on Halloween night, including blowing out the jack-o'-lanterns before midnight or something like that. Um, if you break those rules, Mr. Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Sam will come for you. And so the movie is an absolute blast. Um, it had a $12 million budget. I hope they made that back on DVD sales uh, pretty good ratings on Rotten Tomatoes, 82 from critics, 72 from the audience. But it is an absolute blast to watch this time of the year. I'll have so, to look into that. I have not seen this. Neither movie. one of you have seen Trick or Treat. Uh, Andrew's probably <laughs> waving his hand at home. Yeah. I saw it. I saw it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is a it's fun, a tip of the hat to you, fun. Andrew. To watch. <laughs> so I really do uh, recommend uh, Trick or Treat. It's just such a fun movie uh, to watch. Um, do you want me to continue going on my list, or do you guys want to get to some of the movies that you enjoy watching uh, this I've time got, of the year? I've got a pretty good yeah. one, if yeah, you yeah, wouldn't mind. Uh, uh, all right, George, what would you, you enjoy watching this time of the year? Thunder? No, no. Okay, good, good, good. Do do I'm usually piggybacking off, uh, off Joe. I'm like, yep, thing, yep, Friday night, yep. <laughs> That's usually the case. We, yeah. we have similar tastes in So movies. one of my favorite Halloween movies is Extraterrestrial or E.T., I love that. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I've seen that on some Halloween lists, and it, it kind of reminds me of the Die Hard argument. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie because it's set at Christmas time? Is E.T. a Halloween movie because it's set at Halloween? I I don't know the answer to that question, <laughs> but I do know that there's a great scene where they all go out. They're all dressed up. Oh, yeah. And it's like one of those things, I think there's a movie called, it, it, I can't remember, it's called Twin Falls, Idaho, or something like that, where these twins that are conjoined, this is a separate movie, they go out once a year as themselves, and everybody walks up and goes, wow, great, you know, great costume, this is fantastic. <laughs> it's the same thing with, you know, the little E.T. guy, he goes out, and he's dressed up as something else. A little ghost, yeah. little ghost thing, right? And um, it's just kind of fun to watch them go around and all the things that they do, um, how they get ready for, for Halloween. And the, the I can't remember. Do you remember the name of the mother? She's smoking uh, hot. Yeah, uh, and she's in this little actress, cat outfit. Yeah. She's got these little ears on. Yeah, and it'll pop into my head. Yeah, and she's like just that. miserable because her kids haven't come home. And the Dee reason- Dee Wallace is the actress. Yeah, Dee Wallace. Dee Wallace, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, but the, the fun part about it is, is that we went out trick or treating, and we got into all kinds of other trouble. We weren't home until late, and that's one of the reasons I love about that. Is my I always put my mother and father through the ringer on that. <laughs> nice. But anyway, go ahead. No, uh, I, I I kind of agree that it Halloween movie doesn't necessarily have to mean scary movie. Right. No, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, like the fly isn't necessary. Halloween. I mean, it's scary. It's a horror yeah. movie. Yeah, it's, it's a horror true. movie. Yeah. 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 Is it a horror movie? The fly. I mean, I, th I thought oh, it was I kind of it, science horror, it, horror well, science. Well, sci-fi, yeah. yeah, horror, but I think it ticks all the Yeah, I think it does. Man. Yeah, I think I mean, right. the man is crawling on the wall looking like that. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that'll be like, he just appears and like, yeah, that, that'll, that'll scare the hell out of me. That does, yeah. Right. No, but I, yeah, I, 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 can, I can voice a, a vote of support for E.T. being a Halloween movie. It, yeah. Like I said, Halloween doesn't have doesn't But it's have not be, a horror movie. Yeah, it doesn't Absolutely have to be horror. Not. There's too much heart. Yeah. 
like there's a there's a an animated film. I, I was talking to Joe about this, I think, in two podcasts ago. It's called The Halloween Tree. Oh, right. Yeah, and it's an animated film. Very, it came out in the late '80s, maybe early no early '90s, and the concept was this: these four friends they're getting ready to go trick or treating, and their buddy gets sick. They, yeah. they they show up at his house, and he's being loaded in the ambulance, and he, had, he apparently had to have an appendectomy. Well, it turns out I think the it didn't go well. I think he he was going to die. His soul goes flying around, and so then his three friends go chasing his soul. What's it called again? The Halloween the Halloween, Halloween tree. tree. Wow. So the long story short, they they end up get, get, get chasing his soul. They catch it, and the the great you know overseer kind of says, "I'll tell you what, you get your friend's soul if each one of you gives one year of your life to do it." And you, these are all kids, so they don't know if they could. One of them could die five years from now, so then they got four years left. They don't know. He said, "You give one year of your life, and you you get your buddy's soul back." And they all did it, and but. You know, they had to stop and think, like, okay, you know, you all think you might live to, like, 89. Well, okay, if I live to 89, what, what, what's the big deal at 88? You say that now, you could be. So it just, I was like, <laughs> no, this I is think a kid's that's movie? great. I think that's great. I haven't seen that. No, no I, I, at the time, I was, you know, when I was watching, I was like, oh, it's pretty cool. I was like, then, I, you know, when I get old, I'm like, wow, that's a, a little bit dark and it kind of makes you think, like, these are kids making these decisions. What about now, the, I did what find the... it streaming. I found, I was looking for stuff to watch. I did see it streaming. I almost started it. And I watched a little preview that they will have before you decide to rent something. And the thing I couldn't get past on that particular movie, and I, I'm hoping somebody does like a modern retelling of it, was the animation. Yeah. The animation was sort of that Rankin Bass. Remember the old uh, the Hobbit kind of uh, anim oh. animation that they did all those years ago? It it kind of had a flat, very stylized. Yeah, and, and I, I didn't like that. I didn't either, really yeah. care for the animation in the film, and the concept sounds great, and I'd love to see like a, a live action, you know, reimagining of it. That would be <laughs> yeah. fantastic. No, my brother put that on to me, and I was just watching this as when I was a kid. I was going, "Oh my god!" So no, it's a, again, but it, you wouldn't consider it a horror movie, but it's at Halloween. It's something that the kids would watch, and and uh, when I was watching, some people and you're watching with your friends. Hey man, would you give up a year to save me? And everyone's like, "Yeah, dude, I'm not gonna let you die." Like, yeah. And these are all kids, you know. And you're talking to your buddies, and you get older. Like, how about now? I don't know. He kind of a he kind of a dick later. So. <laughs> uh, and you owe me twenty bucks, so I mean, maybe. Yeah. No. So I I get what you're saying that you know a movie doesn't have to be a horror movie. And a perfect example of that, which is on my list here, is Ghostbusters. You know, Ghostbusters isn't necessarily a horror movie, even though it has its moments. But it's a it's a uh, slob comedy with. I mean, the you know, chair moment. That, co that that'll be a little bit with Sigourney Weaver in, in the chair. Uh huh. When she gets taken to the all the hands come yeah. out, and pull her into the kitchen, or and one of them got handsy. When I watch it in <laughs> yeah, hindsight, I'm like, hey, you knew exactly where your hand was going, there, buddy. <laughs> or like the librarian scene, you know, when yeah. uh, they're trying to, you know pursue this librarian ghost and then she turns into something uh, horrific so it does have its moments but that's that's not its priority its priority is a laugh out loud comedy that is based in reality you know dan Aykroyd is a, a paranormal uh, aficionado and loves the paranormal and so he wrote a lot of true science into this film so the Tobin spirit guide yeah one, yeah one of the things that they're talking about like I had no idea that these things existed turns out <laughs> that they do or whatever and and, and, and uh, Egon delivered that so straight I love that yeah he yeah great. he was he was great I think he was a co-writer on it yeah. with Dan Aykroyd but yeah, that's a perfect example of a movie that isn't necessarily considered a horror movie, but it's a Halloween movie. It's a fun movie to watch this time of the year. And, you know, I've said this many times on this podcast, my favorite horror movies are movies that in incorporate uh, some level of humor. That yes. Yes. You're laughing one mo moment and then, you know, scared the next moment. And, and Ghostbusters is just a perfect example. I that. think that's a perfect rep recipe. Like if I look at some of the most perfect movies, like one of them I think uh, is uh, Forrest Gump. And one of the reasons I like Forrest Gump is because it's serious, then it's humorous, then it's then it's um, adventurous, yeah. and then it's scary, and then it's sad. And yeah, it's yeah. just like I love that they play, that they push all those buttons. Yeah. I would say E.T. kind of goes along those road, those oh lines. Oh, my God. Um, I think back to, you know, my, my sisters and my cousins had seen E.T. E. in the theater before I did. And they're like, Joe, you got to see this movie. And I'm like, okay. And I remember we get to the movie, we get to the theater, and I remember there's a certain moment in this the, the scene where they're looking for him. 
and I notice my sisters and my cousins are all leaning forward looking oh, at me. Oh, to see if you're going to And oh, break it. wow, I was a blubbering oh, yeah. mess with snot bubbles. I mean, it was ugly <laughs> crying. That movie really, really spoke to me. And uh, yeah, but yeah that, so but it had that, a little bit of all that. That, that air of comedy and that air of, of having having believable characters and people that are talking about other things, like it just makes it much more real. And then you watch something like, you know, it's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And I just, I never understood that. Did you guys ever watch that? Oh, I, I watch it every year. I, I can't absolutely stand it. Love it. I love, I just, I love really? it for Snoopy. Because when he fights the Red Baron. Oh, I love a, that. I do love part. that. Tell me what you don't like about the great pumpkin. You are the I've first been human being to ever watching it since I was a that. kid, trying to understand why anybody doesn't see it other than just very flat performances, huh. very flat <laughs> jokes. That's it's my opinion. But, no, but I mean everybody but me loves it. I don't know why. I don't know why people love it. I, I love it. I, I love I love it for Snoopy. That that's that's Prince of my I, yeah, I, he's pretty I give funny you that. in the cartoon, I give you that. But. I love the, the the but he's not in it. And uh, the way he laughs is hysterical. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> I like when they're doing the piano scene and he goes from crying to, to happy. being happy and crying. Based on what Schroeder does. No, but you guys bring up an extra, extra, excellent point. There has to be some element of humor, and it's all based on the characters. Jaws. I love watching Jaws. I consider it a horror movie. Mm -hmm. And it had Spielberg ca made the character the way they wanted uh, for um, Hooper. It, it wouldn't have worked. Getting Richard Dreyfuss to play Hooper as he was was fantastic. He brought all the humor to that. He's like, hey, uh, is there a good restaurant? Yeah, you walk straight ahead. <laughs> They're all going to die. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. You know, he's like, hey, you know all those guys in the fishbowl? Yeah, none of them are going to leave the dock alive. <laughs> and and, and, and it, it's just, it's perfect. Like, I, th I think you're going to ignore this problem until it swims up and bites you in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, the interesting uh, background behind The Great Pumpkin is, uh, you know, they did they did the Christmas Charlie Brown special, which was a, smash hit just an enormous hit uh that touched on you know religious themes and all sorts of stuff people absolutely loved it so the network basically demanded another one we need another charlie brown peanut special and they're like well what do we have to to you know borrow from and charles schultz was like well i you know i do this great pumpkin thing you know every year come halloween maybe we could turn that in so he wrote some jokes and stuff and told the story and uh, when they aired it, it was another smash hit along the lines of, of the, the Christmas special. And, uh, you know, there are silly little things in it. Like one thing that always bugs me is when uh, Charlie Brown gets a bag full of rocks. And I'm like, what asshole is handing out rocks on Halloween? Now, it's a cartoon, and sure. that's Charlie Brown's luck. But when you really start thinking about it, it's like, who's handing out rocks on Halloween? Right. But it's for me, it's something as a kid I look forward to every year. Uh, another animated special that I love watching every year is the uh, Disney uh, Ichabod Crane yes. Sleepy Hollow animated special. It's beautifully illustrated and animated with the compelling characters and music and Bing Crosby doing the narration. So for me, I like watching those two cartoons back to back and then watching a good scary movie to you know kind of counterbalance it or whatever but um well, one thing i did want to say about et um you know i love visiting filming locations in la and uh there's a friend of mine that He's lives gonna do it again well He's i'm not gonna, right now. Not gonna name, right now. perfect it's not coming gonna up. name names but uh, <laughs> a friend of mine lives in porter ranch california and she lets me stay in their guest house or their loft that they have depending on what's available and uh so i was talking to her and i said you know i love looking for filming locations. And she's like, well, you know, we have some filming locations right here in Porter Ranch. And I'm like, what was filmed in Porter Ranch? Uh, E.T. Uh, so I found where they went trick-or-treating, the neighborhood where they went trick-or-treating. I found the park with this caterpillar-like thing that kids would climb. That appears in the movie when, the, uh, when Elliot tells his friends and when they're on their bikes, meet me at the park. They all meet there yeah. when they're in the white van and the kids are on the bikes. And so it was really cool standing in lo these locations that you saw in the yeah. film. It was yeah, yeah, really yeah. surreal. So I get a, a real kick out of that. So if you're an E.T. fan, uh, do the uh, Porter Ranch tour. There's some really cool locations Porter there, Ranch. and it's, okay. it's changed they so still have much. the forest right there, the redwoods right there, or was that kind of— No, the redwoods are way up north. No, it made it look like they just— Went right into it, and I was wondering if that was the case, but that's not. Yeah, no, I think there was some uh, movie magic there. Yeah. Um, 
Now let's talk about, I love ghost stories. And that's something we haven't touched on our last couple of podcasts are ghost stories. And one of my favorite ghost stories is a movie that came out in 1980 called The Changeling. Oh. Not to be confused with the, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, John Voight's daughter. What's Angelina her? Jolie. Yeah, she did a movie called The Changeling, yeah. which I think was something completely different. Um, and The Changeling, uh, spoiler alert, sort of sort of reveals the, the plot a little bit. It reveals a plot twist in the title. Um, but it stars George C. Scott as a uh, older guy who uh, is invited to live in a historic home because otherwise it would just go unused and it would remain empty. So the historical society is like, you might as well live in it if no one else is. So he moves into this historic home and starts getting these weird experiences and weird little noises. And some things are genuinely terrifying. And uh, there's an amazing seance scene where they try to contact whoever's responsible for the activity in the home. And the cool thing is, is it sort of transforms from a, a ghost story to sort of a murder mystery where the ghost is trying to help George C. Scott solve the mystery of his demise. And it is fantastic. It is a great movie. And I don't have any memories of seeing it when it came out back in 1980. It was something I discovered a little bit later. And I'm like, why is this movie under the radar? It is one of the, the best ghost stories I've ever seen in my life. It's really fantastic. And I don't think it's R, if I'm not mistaken, right? No, no, it's pretty it's, mild stuff. There was another one that kind of came out like that, uh, Watcher in the Woods, which is pretty cool, but it was also kind of boring. Um, I went and saw it and was about bored to tears and then saw it years later and I thought I must have just been a little kid but both of them have a very slow moving story they build nicely yeah um, but no the changeling is really cool and the way they explain it even as a kid when I saw it I was like yeah. oh that's what happened that's why this ghost is so unhappy and, yeah and yeah, it it's not a ghost rattling chains and screaming for no reason yeah yeah this is a you know, they, and, and there's there's this thing that Hollywood does with ghosts, like, well, they, they weren't ever able, the reason they stay here is they weren't able to go into the netherworld or yeah. to, to pass on or whatever. Right. I'm getting so sick of that. It's like every movie saying, oh, he's the chosen one. I don't know. There's just so many movies that do it. You just get sick of it. Yeah. But this one was different. Yeah. This guy has uh, a bone to pick. And yeah, exactly. he wants somebody else to feel his pain. Yeah. And uh, and I thought that was really genuinely interesting. And I love George C. Scott. So cool to see George oh, C. Was Scott. Great Just at, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of along the same lines, another ghost story that I discovered, I don't know how many years ago. It wasn't, I didn't see it when it came out. It was something I discovered later. You guys ever seen a movie called The Others starring Nicole Kidman? I love that movie. My wife Have loves you seen that it? movie. Yes. It has one of the greatest twists uh, oh, it's that so great. M. Night Shyamalan would be envious of. It has one of the greatest twists. We haven't talked I've about Shyamalan. Seen. That's too bad. Yeah, he's yeah. on my list. The Sixth Sense is another I one love I the think Sixth is Sense. a fun one to watch. But let's this stick time with the others. Yeah, Nicole Kidman. I wonder if we're making that as a recommendation. I mean, maybe yeah. pause your pause your mute your uh or maybe we won't talk about it. I don't it, I don't want to do any it. spoilers, but that's it's a fantastic a, it's a great movie. ghost story, but yeah. it turns out it's what you're watching isn't quite what you think it is. And uh, the reveal was just fantastic. It and, is fantastic. And, and it's the same thing with, with, uh, with The Sixth Sense. You know, I was, I consider myself lucky that when I saw The Sixth Sense in the theaters, I did not see the twist coming. Now, some people are like, oh, I saw it coming a mile away. And I, no, no, I you feel didn't. bad for you because no, you didn't. that's the fun of the movie. The twist is makes the whole makes you want to rewatch the entire film when you learn what the yes. twist is. So that's also yes. like people saying, you know, I always knew spoiler. I always knew that uh, Vader was Luke's father. Like really, <laughs> you knew that. You got I, the I, I, no. Yeah. I'm sorry. You should have said something earlier. You said I always knew that. It's like why don't you pipe up and say it's easy to say it afterward, right? There yeah. are there are hints though when you think about it. Like the word Vader kind of sounds like Father, well, that's, I, yeah, know, so that's Darth sort of Vader means Dark Father in, yeah, yeah. in no, but Dutch, I, mean, I believe. When people were saying that, I'm like, hey, let's get out of here. It's like, I, you know, I knew the sixth sense. I knew it was the, I'm like, all right, okay. Well, it could also be con construed as like like a father, like a padre or something. Yeah. I don't know, like, you know, like in, in the Catholic Church or something. But no, anyway, you're right. On. But yeah, those are two great ghost stories with great twists, and they're so much fun when when the twist is revealed and I really enjoy stuff like that. The village is really good. I like the village. I don't know if you saw that. You know, you know, you're going to laugh now. 
I saw the twist coming a mile away. <laughs> on that one, did you really? Yeah, I did. I and kept I, wondering uh, if the twist was going to happen, so I didn't know. I kept thinking, no, there's no way. No, there's, and then it did happen. I was like, ah, but I still liked it. Yeah. I, I almost and then he, Signs. Yeah. Signs is really great. Go ahead. No, Signs was good. I, I just feel like once he did the twist, he's like, oh, great. They're going to expect me to have a twist in every movie. Damn it. <laughs> and he pretty much does. And that's kind of his gimmick, and it's almost, it's almost kind of tiresome because – when you do, go do, and I stopped going to see his movies a while back because it got to the point where it's like he, he would come up with the twist and then write an entire movie around it. And I'm like, that's not how you make movies. You can't just write the twist and build a movie around it. It's got to be organic. I mean, I, I love signs because of the family component and what was, and then, but when you stop and think about it, so you guys came to a planet that's 70% death for you? It rains uh, yeah, death. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. it, it rains death. You have space travel. This was really a poor choice. Frank, I who think, picked this planet? I think I think the water thing was a problem. But if you get up to, if you do, if you look at ninety nine percent of it, it, it's still the idea that what happens when everybody's locked in a house. Right, it goes back to that. For me, that's and and you can make up whatever alien you want. And and regrettably, that that the ending and all of that brings it down. I think from an A plus to like a B. In yeah, my I, I agree. I, I thought the ending was really contrived. The, what I the only thing I really liked about Signs is how during an alien v- invasion movie, you see the grand scale of it. You see the ships like an Independence Day, yeah. like circling the Earth, and and there's drawn out space battle and stuff. What was intriguing about Signs is you saw it from the perspective of a family yes. on television yes. and in their home, and you, there seeing was not movement third outside person the house omniscient and, where yeah. you got to see it all. You're right. You're yeah. You're right. Yeah. And, and so, a guy who had lost his faith because of. You know, his wife dying, and how could you make peace with it? Right. That I thought was a fascinating uh, back part of the story. Yeah. So there was really two stories going on at the same time, and they converge at the end, and I thought that was masterful, even though I didn't like the whole water thing. Right, but th- th- yeah. that was the thing when I was like, okay, I see what you're trying to do, and that's where I almost felt like, had he just told that story, that's great. He could just left, how do we stop the aliens? Ah, we'll figure it out. And I would have been okay with that. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was a story about this family and how you perceived an, an, the start of an alien invasion, maybe. Yeah. And how, how would this happen? Like, oh, I wonder what would happen. And just let the audience ask, what do you I, think happened? I love the scene where, he go, where they board up all the windows and the doors, and he says to the kids, he says, guys, I'm hungry. What do you guys want to eat? And they go, anything? And he says, anything. Because <laughs> they don't know if they're going to make it another yeah. 24 hours. Yeah. That to me was such a great family scene. Yeah. Like, well, they, what like, if all hell breaks loose? Even if nuclear bombs or COVID or whatever you worry about, if that I wa- was a great scene. If I wanted a bowl of fruity pebbles and a, and a plate of spaghetti, <laughs> let's do. It. And Dad says it's okay. Yeah. You yeah. know it's the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dad's giving me fruity pebbles and bacon or whatever it is, you know yeah. or whatever. Well, let me ask you guys this because I feel like I'm missing something in that particular movie where. You know, early on, there's the accident involving his wife. And then, you know, one of her last words is swing away or whatever. And then later on in the movie, he remembers those words and starts swinging away. And I'm like, how, why, like, why did she say that? What, what made her say that? And how was that relevant to the story? And uh, did I miss something? No, because I'm... you have to write a story around a concept. Right. Not that, that's the part he's like, oh, God, I had this deep story about this family dealing with tragedy and how, their perspective of an alien invasion. Oh, crap. Okay. Yeah, swing away, and she always leaves bottles of wa- uh, gl- unfinished b- I know, water yeah, all I over. Know. That's it, why it that, felt so contrived to me. I think, like, I think with a few— Shoehorning. The problem is, is I think with a few edits, a few, like a, maybe another six months or a year of people just thinking it through, <laughs> saying, couldn't we replace— the the water with like infrared light or I don't know something that's yeah that wasn't still obvious, easy to yeah. quote get but not as obvious or whatever yeah. or neon uh, or fluorescent lights because yeah. they, they could have borrowed something from War of the Worlds how did they know yeah that, uh, the, you know coming over here that simple bacteria will kill them I'm like yeah. well an infection yeah. you should have known that's a different <laughs> thing on that movie you should have known they're an advanced civilization no, you think you, they'd you be cross, aware you cross, of you cross light sure, years yeah, you yeah. didn't feel like it, Everybody remember to take your inoculation before going down to these savages. Yeah. Maybe maybe uh, M. Night uh, got the idea from the Wizard of Oz because something people tend to bring up is 
knowing that water can kill the Wicked Witch of the West, why would she have a bucket of it sitting, sitting on a ledge feet. in the castle? And yeah. why is anyone mopping that castle? Why? <laughs> it's, the only reason that bucket exists is to bring uh, an end I, to the Wicked Witch. I feel like it serves just, no other purpose. You just undid some therapy in my brain because I was I I keep seeing Wicked and the, the, all the damn Target ads and everything. Yeah, I'm getting I, I'm so I'm so tired. I'm so tired. The theater majors are running everything now. This is the revenge of the theater majors. <laughs> like we, they were, they were ridiculed. I'll let my and, son know. I mean, no, exactly. But no, but the thing, they were ridiculed and looked down. Like I can't believe you're going into theater. You're wasting your life. And now, every commercial is singing. It's in every movie. Yeah. It's in every. And this is the revenge of the theater majors. Like, oh, you ridicule our life choice and artistic style. Enjoy everything. It's in sports. Here it comes. It's in politics. Whatever you want, you can't escape it. It's mm-hmm. in video, video games. Join us for me. our next podcast, movie musicals, and uh, <laughs> yes. I oh, I love it. I love it. I, Let's do it. I love that's musicals. In our oh I gosh, don't get me started. You, you talk about Hollywood blockbusters. <laughs> Those are blockbusters, and there's an era for that. I yeah. mean, yeah. I mean, uh, but look. Uh, <laughs> well, let's uh, getting back to uh, ghost stories. I want to get your opinion. Uh, there was a movie. So there was a trend in Hollywood that lasted, I don't know, maybe a decade of the found footage movie. Uh, The one that launched it all was Blair Blair Witch, Witch. which I hated. I despised Blair Witch. I saw it in the theater, and I remember the entire audience getting angry, like, that was it? That's what everyone's been talking about? But I thought— But you knew beforehand it was fake. Well, because I'm a sane, rational human being, anyone who went in (laughs) thinking that this was actual VHS tapes that someone found and released as a Uh, film, I don't know. Uh, So obviously I knew going in and they had set up a website and all that stuff. I'll jump on that plane with you, Drew. Yeah. Now, the, the trope, the genre of the found footage movie, I thought, improved over time especially with a little franchise called paranormal activity yeah, yeah that now i saw one. the first paranormal activity in 2000 well it was released in 2007 but then it got a re-release in 2009 that went uh, wide and it was a phenomenon I and i it. thought it was I one of the scariest fantastic. movies i'd ever seen because Me too. it was so subtle it was so subtle just little things that the camera would pick up sheets moving doors yep. opening shadows to me, less is more. And yes. until Paramount, they threw two hundred grand at the film to add uh, the ending that uh, was uh, kind of effects heavy uh, because they felt like it needed it. But um, but for the most part, it was very simple and genuinely scary. And each subsequent sequel that came out, I thought was pretty good. I think I saw the first three. I don't know if I saw the fourth and beyond. Uh, but I thought those were, they were genuinely scary, had some really good moments, and I really enjoyed them a lot. And I love the gimmick of how do we keep this found footage thing going. And I, I love how they would, like, put a camera on an oscillating fan and have it just pan back and forth, and then there would be, like, a reveal of something standing yeah. there. Very, very clever and well done. I, I think, for me, they took the Hollywood out. Mm-hmm. of that yeah yeah and when they gave it to spielberg I, as i understand the story goes that he watched it and then he wouldn't touch it so he he pulled it out with <laughs> with gloves on and put it in a garbage <laughs> sack and handed it to them because he was so scared i don't know how true that is i really love the fact that i had never seen these people before yeah so i didn't associate oh she was in this exactly in fact the acting was kind of poor in some areas and that mm-hmm. actually lended that more sold it. to selling that yeah but there's nothing to me more horrific than having a woman stand on the side of the bed as you're tossing and turning the night and she's staring yeah. at you yeah and they do that time lapse thing and the time lapse thing standing and she's standing there, standing there. hours and yeah. it wasn't that she had what well, so what you could show that to a four-year-old <laughs> an eight-year-old a 12-year-old and they'd look at that and go um what's okay. to be scared here for me yeah. i saw it in the movie theater and i was i had to leave yeah. I have very few things I have oh, wow. to leave. I had to leave. My wife can back me up on this. I had to leave and come back. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, she goes, you can go to the bathroom. Once I, I would that it was going to the bathroom, but I, it scared me. I got into love, my operating system. I would yeah. love the fact that when you both, good night, honey, love you too. George just kind of looking at his wife over his shoulder, yeah. turning off the light, just watching her. Like, she turns around, hey, George, what, yeah. why are you staring at me? Why are you looking at me, honey? Yeah. Just well, I think that the thing that's horrific about that is that he's sleeping quietly, 
and five inches from him is is evil. Yeah. And he doesn't know it. He doesn't wake up and go, hey, what, what, what do you snap out of it? Yeah. He doesn't find out until the next morning. Um, now they that did that to me is this the horrific part of it. They know? did Hollywood up the uh, the two sequels. They started adding some effects and oh, stuff. Oh, that's, but that's I, inevitable. I thought it was still effective. Like, there's one scene that haunts me where the little girl, uh, she's in her bedroom or whatever, and the the spirit, the entity, like picks her up by her ponytail, like off the ground. And then releases her, and she goes running out of the room screaming. And I'm like, "Oh my god!" I'm getting goosebumps just <laughs> thinking about you know, it. A and franchise it's terrifying. that did well with that without being found footage was The Conjuring. Yeah, I I saw the first Conjuring. My my reaction to The Conjuring is it had a lot of elements from uh, previous movies that yeah. I've seen. And again, this goes into everything is inspired by something. But as I was watching The Conjuring, I'm like, "Okay, it's a little Amityville horror." It's a little this, it's a little that, it's a little, yeah. So it felt like kind of a hodgepodge of a lot of uh, horror movies that came before it. I did something that cost me uh, very precious and very limited sanity that I have. When I was younger, a a a few friends and I decided to do a a horror marathon for right in the month of October. And this was The Exorcist, The Omen, Fright Night, Salem's Lot, Howling. Oh, Salem's Lot. Yeah, we were going through the these things, yeah. uh, Jaws, and then we, I, you get to a breaking point. I guess we we're like, hey, we're still okay, right? Yeah, we're, 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 you know, we're guys. We'll be fine. Yeah. We saw a movie with Richard Gere, and I forgot who else is in it, and and, and, and I'm really sorry to, The Mothman Prophecies. I've heard of it. I've never seen oh, it. Oh, yeah. Is that with? Uh... It's with Richard Gere and with someone else. It's about a bridge collapse, that, that a tragedy that happened. Yeah. And you wouldn't think anything of it but i don't know if it's because we 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 basically soaked ourselves in horror before that watching that movie as the cap it broke us really because that because by the time we were done is it, it was, because it was rooted in some reality yeah. or science the, based or on based on, a, on a, inspired by real events kind of thing and we we're like oh wait what hmm. and so we watch it this movie ends around 2 30 all <laughs> all all the leaves all, all the naked branches and you see the shadows <laughs> coming across the yeah, yeah. You know, branches against yeah, the glass and, and, and you hear it, and then the wind swing you hear the <laughs> and it's like the little scratching notes. we have grown men going hey can you keep the light and watch me walk to my car <laughs> like yeah you go for it buddy yeah and so they leave and i'm in the house alone cuz my parents have gone out of town for the weekend i'm like oh and then we all text each other hey are you home yeah i'm home are you sleeping no i'm not are you yeah i think we i think we kind of overdid it now you got me thinking about something. We got a little over ten minutes left here. I kind of maybe we can fill in the rest of the time with this. I want to ask each of you, what is the scariest movie you've ever seen? Like, like you said, um, the movie that maybe let's, you let's, left the light in the closet on. Let's put let's put a let's put some 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 uh, some rules here. The scariest movie I've ever seen was. Um, the Schindler's List. So well, yeah, so, I'm talking about yeah, okay, more of a fun vein. I mean, that's, so it would have that's to be for me yeah. paranormal activity. But but oh, actually, okay. before then, I saw The Exorcist, and I had yeah. no idea what was going on. And um, mm. I won't say it out. Uh, I won't say it. But there's a part where Reagan, that the young woman, she's doing these different things, mm-hmm. and as a as a sweet young Mormon guy seeing this at 15 years old, yeah, uh, freaked me out. Well, I'm glad you brought that movie up because for me, hands down, that's the scariest movie yeah. ever made, The Exorcist. I, and maybe it's because it. of its, you know, religious connotations yeah. and that, you know, uh, Max von we've been Sadov told, or Seidel. Yeah, we've been awesome. told that this is based on actual, uh, you know, events or whatever. I'm not even a member of the club. And <laughs> I thought I was like, holy crap. Yeah, and then <laughs> I remember, I remember getting together with some friends. And we got the version where they they restored some deleted scenes, which oh. escalated it. There was the famous uh, spider walk where yep. Reagan is walking down the stairs like a crab or whatever. And uh, that is a movie, and I'm not even exaggerating here, that I was probably in my mid-teens. Yeah. I turned the closet light on and laid in bed with the closet light on. Yeah. It really really freaked me the stuff out coming out of her skin saying help me like yeah. just the words and then the voice in there the voices and knowing and they take things they take about... the tape and they're like we these are ancient languages we haven't heard on planet earth for yeah. over a millennia the, or something the things that stood out to me aren't just the head turning it's the, it, when she's on the bed and she's being and you see the shadow overlaying of, of the the demon the demon yeah the statue oh, when she's like this and you yeah. just see she's writhing i'm like what in the hell 
And yeah. only twice do they ever show the demon's face. Yeah. Like it's like a quick uh, it has like a white face. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Before it takes possession of the of the, yeah. of the priest. And yes. then I'm like, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's almost a subliminal message. Like, yeah. Bam. Like, yeah. Oh. And, and and like doing the I think it was the priest's mother, like, you know, doing the voice, like me, like talking to him and he's like, Is that you, Mom? It's just terrifying. I, it's I, hands I, down the scariest movie I've ever seen. I had a few Christian friends. I went, I get it, guys. Yeah. I get it. You guys have a lot in your, in your plate. <laughs> it does. I, I got to be honest, though. I wish I could go back in time and see, you know, how like people, um, I wish I could go back in time and have and reset all the things in my brain so that I'm still innocent and naive because the cocaine jolt I got for lack of or <laughs> whatever it is, adrenaline or whatever it is that you get from watching those movies Nowadays, people will say, oh, this is a really scary movie, and you go through it, and I just laugh through it. And yeah. I you know, I typically uh, root, for, root for anybody who's the bad guy because, you know, <laughs> she, she deserves to die. But I, I really miss having really good nightmares based on silly things. Now I have yeah. nightmares about, you know, about yeah. terrible, really mm-hmm. terrible things. But at that age, my nightmares, I look back on them, that, that was such a wonderful time to watch movies yeah. is about when you're like nine to about 18, right yeah. in there. Yeah. You know, I had cable you know TV I mean, right? most of my life. And so, you know, when my mom would go to bed, not that she was, you know, my mom never said, Oh, you can't watch that. But there was something about when mom went to bed, watching something you didn't feel like you were supposed to be watching. And, and, you know, one movie that comes to mind is, is like the Amityville horror. You yeah, know, yeah. imagine, being a teenager watching that movie and hearing get out, you know, stuff like that. It's freaking terrifying. And it stays with me that I'm a sponge. Like I absorb this stuff when I'm in a darkened I theater do too. I, it's, it's part of me. It, it makes messes me with my I operating am. system. It's like somebody lifted up the little flap in the back of my <laughs> back and started, you know, switching, yeah. switching all the f- fuses. What does this around. Do? Yeah, exactly. How, what like if I a, turn this all the way up? It's like in the thing when he's playing chess against a computer and the computer wins and he, opens it up and pours his drink in there. Yeah. That's kind of what happens to me when I see these movies. My brain short circuit. You know, George brought up an excellent point. And there's almost an, as the older I get, there's an envy. When I see other, it's kind of like when your your family is watching you at E.T. Seeing, uh, I get to see them watch horror for the first yes. time. And yes. I can only capture yes. that because I, I watched, <laughs> that was the expression I had because I can't relive that. I'd love to. But Peter Jackson said something similar. He's like, I watch, I watch everyone else enjoy Lord of the Rings. I know everything. I I made. Oh, it. that's a oh, really right. good point. He he's, he doesn't get to be excited. Or, wow! When, look at these when the, so he that's why he watched it. When everyone else is like <gasps> gasping and cheering, he goes, "Okay." Yeah. So I I got my satisfaction like that because I knew everything. I was wish I could have watched it like that. Yeah. I, oh, I, that's interesting. I made a horror film in, around 2010 about a Ouija board. It's 30 minutes. You can find it on YouTube. It's yeah. called Oracle. And I could kind of relate to that. Not to put myself in the category of Peter Jackson, but. You know, I spent hours and hours and hours over the course of several weeks editing this together. And, and then when we finally got to show it in the movie theater in Royal Oak, it's kind of fun sitting there in a the theater surrounded by literally 100 people and looking for reactions and listening for laughter <laughs> yeah. or, or whatever. It's a thrill. It's an absolute S- thrill. S- Spielberg said that for Jaws. He's like, that was a night. That movie still gives him nightmares because of the yeah. production of it. But he would watch people in the theaters like, I wonder how they're going <laughs> to feel about this. And they scream. One guy got up and ran out. I think in the, in the behind and the scenes. That yeah. must have been so good for him. But he got out and he puked and he went, "Oh, I think I overdid it." <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, "He was like, oh, this is great. Oh, there are people getting out and running out. It's like, oh." It's, and then the guy goes, he gets out, he's like, bleh, 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 and then bleh, and oh, puked. Geez. And and, uh, and, and Spielberg's like, I "Might have overdone it." <laughs> I, I loved getting that feedback and having people after seeing my film come up to me and say, oh, "I see what you did there," and I'm like, "Do tell. What what did I do there?" Because People brought their own baggage oh. to the film, and they're like, "So this guy was doing this because of this," and I'm like, "That's an interesting take, uh, you know." Yeah, like I'm sure at people, some point you're like, "Yeah, yeah that's was exactly what I was doing." Joe, Joe just picking at scabs. You just want someone coming. <laughs> My sister used the Ouija board. She's been missing. I only remember now because your your movie brought it back. Yeah. Thank you. I'm like, uh, I'm yeah, glad yeah. you enjoyed it. Stay for the popcorn. <laughs> yeah. So no, there's something about horror films that you know tap into people's fears and and anxieties and uh, you know i think we talked about this before where to me it's like being on a roller coaster and 
going on the hills and the loops and the drops, and you're yes. scared out of your mind, but you have this harness on that uh, isn't going to let you fly out. Then yeah. you roll in back into the station, and your heart is racing, but you yes. know that you just experienced this uh, this uh, range of emotions, but you were safe the entire time. And that's what movies do is is you get to experience these feelings and emotions in a safe environment and then afterward, you're like, let's go do it again. Let's let's get back in line. You know, you brought up industry. That'd be like going to a theme park and going on a roller coaster. Said, this will be the greatest ride of your life. There's a thirty percent chance you'll die on this ride. <laughs> and uh, most people be like, well, then I'm not getting on that. But you yeah. you know, there's some people. But it's gonna be the greatest ride of our life. Well, that's like, like parish, you know, skydiving. That's you know, there's a chance you're gonna die in yeah. skydiving, and people need to push it to that limit to experience. Anything like I, I, if I don't pull that ripcord, I am going to die. I don't need to take it that far. If you want to take it that far, that's up to you. To but be I fair, don't need for to the do first that. timers, there's a person on your back. So I'm like, I'm, <laughs> that's why I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure you don't want to die either. Yeah. And the cameraman who's recording my my frightful thing, you don't want me to die either. Yeah. So we're good, right? So, so for the record, when I was a kid, uh, I had a friend named David King. His older brother was named Stephen King. Ooh. Stephen King went out on his very first jump with a guy who was on his 1,000th jump mm -hmm. on his back, and they both died. Yeah. It just happened recently. There's, a, a, I guess, some some parachuting company or whatever was getting sued by a family who the, the instructor and the person strapped to them hit the ground. And it's oh. like, so there's, uh, no, you don't have that's, to put yourself in That's such a group. dad move. I love that. Dad, I'm really excited. Well, you know, buddy. You know, when people when white water move. when white water rafting, people have drowned. <laughs> Love you. Have a good time. All right. We'll pick you up later. Just they're white. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like all the blood's gone from their face. Have a good time. These are classified rapids. No. Remember what I said. I, I can't imagine living through the thirties, forties, fifties when they didn't have horror. They had campy, cheesy kind of things, but yeah. we've really over I think the seventies, I think you mentioned this two episodes ago or um we really begin to dial in the science of freaking people out yeah. with the music and the angles oh, yeah. and the long shots. And you, you pull a lot of that from, uh, I suddenly have my own hair in my face here. You pull <laughs> that from, uh, from, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hitchcock. Oh, sure. And, and it starts, you really start to dial it in. You get it from yeah. psycho, you get it from vertigo there's tones, there's notes, you know, in, in psycho is that, <laughs> And Halloween, it's those piano notes that John Carpenter. You both brought up a great, great, great point. There was an evolution to our psyche in this. If you take The Exorcist and Jaws and show it to the 30s, sharks are extinct because the United States government would be like, because oh. you know, so the president just has to watch, be like, I'm never getting in the water again. Just shoot every shark. And for Exorcist, Christi like everyone's going to become a Christian. Like Christianity would go up, like everyone's going to church Can every you Sunday. Taking like Terminator back to the thirties. These are the strange thoughts yeah. I have all the time. Like, what if you were to just or Lord of the Rings? Oh yeah. Uh, anyway. yeah. Oh no. If you take the Terminator, they're like the commies have robots. <laughs> yeah. Like it's over. Like I mean, you change the scope. Like film could do that. Like there are people like yeah. I mean, War of the Worlds. They thought War of the like we're really being inv invaded by aliens. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, yeah. you know that's the thing, and we, c we kind of wind down on this uh -oh. is with each with each decade with each generation, there are fears from that generation that films tapped into, and when technology came into play, and now we're getting into you know AI. We're going to see these movies tap into the new fears that we have. You know, someone just uh, released a movie called Civil War a few years ago about politics going out of control. And and uh, so every generation will have movies that tap into those fears. But those aren't the fun. I don't think those are as fun. Do you? No, I, not at all. No, I'm concerned those. about the people who put the goggle, like meta, and they go and relive Alien and like, Oh, what are you doing? It's like a 16 or what are you? I'm going to watch Alien. You know what you're getting into. I saw it in the theater. It was freaky. You're going to be in the ship with that thing? Don't have a heart condition and wear fresh underwear. Like someone like someone watches The Exorcist like they're in the room with Father Merrick. And like no, I couldn't it, do that Because it's, it's almost like the Matrix. They're putting it on. It's the ear most. They're like, the VR. What's going on? It's like, yeah, mother's like, you know, that, that line. And it's like, they're like, oh, my God. And you're going to be... As a dad, you'd be watching. Yeah, go ahead. And God forbid it's one of your grandkids down the line. You're watching. All right, hang on. Watch this. He just he just crapped himself. I know exactly where he's at. <laughs> well, I wonder if they'll be watching it when they're like 11. Like they get it on their yeah. phone. Like, oh, hey, dad, I watched The Exorcist. No, oh. the dad one, a grand, cool granddad be like, oh, I got this. I should have done this yeah. to you when you were a kid. 
Oh, he's talking a big game. So you're big and brave, huh? All right, go put this on. Don't worry, it'll be fine. <laughs> well, I think I mentioned on the last podcast, our, our, sl- our two podcasts ago, the Slasher Flick podcast, where someone just recently asked me, what's the first horror film you saw? And I believe it was The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which came out in 1976, and I was 10 years old. I saw a brutal slasher flick at 10 years old, and I hope I turned out okay. But Your mother was very liberal. So she was. She was from Spain, so she had different uh, different ideas in Europe. Uh, but on that note, we're going to have to wrap things up. And uh, this is our first live one, hopefully not our last live episode. And um, it's Halloween Eve. I hope everyone has a happy and Joe, safe Halloween. Joe, thank you so much. Yes. I love the opportunity to talk about these. I love being I able agree. to watch these movies. Yeah, yeah, it's fun They're to talk so about them. so fun. Do it all yeah. day. All right, thanks, guys, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks with our next episode of uh, We'll Go Back to Hollywood Blockbuster. Happy Halloween, everybody. See ya. Come to the movies, watch Charlie Chaplin, and put some sunshine into your day. Forget the hard times. Come to the movies and try to laugh your troubles away.